Okay, so we are studying metals. So in the context of metals, suppose we have a metallic block. And yesterday I showed you the scheme for measuring the electrical resistance of this metallic block. You pass a certain current, measure the voltage drop, divide the two, you get the resistance and then take the geometric factor into account and you get the electrical resistivity, right. Now uh, today uh, we are going to change this experiment a little bit. So you still have a metallic block and uh, instead of uh, connecting it to a DC current source, let us connect it to an AC current source. So you can have a current source that produces an AC current. So here you have a current which is alternating. So you can write it as I naught sin omega t for instance. Okay, and then perform the same experiment, you gather the voltage between these two leads, you can solder these two leads and you, you know, measure the voltage drop here and the voltage drop is also going to be a AC voltage drop which may be in phase with the current or may lag behind or lead depending on, you know, what the material is. So, in the case of metals, you expect it to be in phase, okay. So, this is your AC electrical conductivity. as opposed to the DC electrical conductivity that we studied uh, yesterday. So, uh, here this omega can take values starting from 0 up to, you know, kilohertz is very easy. You can do that uh, in the lab using a commonly available function generator, but using very modern lock-ins, you can go up to megahertz. So, that is where you limit, that is the limit of your measurements you cannot go beyond this. Okay. So, you can measure the electrical resistivity in this range from 0 to about 1 megahertz, all right. And typically, you use a lock-in amplifier for such a measurement. And the advantage of lock-in amplifier is that as the name suggests, it picks up a signal or it locks into the signal which corresponds to the frequency of your AC. So, it will reject all the AC noises that are there, that are there in your measurement. So, you use lock-in amplifier. But today what we are going to do is a bit different. So, suppose you have a block of metal, but instead of connecting it to a current source as we did here, let us say we sandwich it between the plates of a capacitor. Okay, so you you have this at a voltage, so again connected to a current source or a, vol or a voltage source which is AC. So this is an open circuit as you have seen, as you can see. Okay, so for first half, one half of the AC cycle, this plate is positively charged and this plate is negatively charged, and therefore there is a. So, forget about the block which is in between, let us say there is no block, then it is a parallel plate capacitor that you have studied very well. So, here you have an have a parallel plate capacitor, okay, and you have connected it to AC source. So, for first one half of the AC cycle, uh, you have a positively charged plate on the left side and the negatively charged plate on the right side. So, the electric field is going from left to right. Now, if I introduce a dielectric block. Mm. Then you know that the electric field inside the dielectric would be non-zero, it will be less than the electric field that you have applied, right, because there will be some charges that will be induced over here. So, these are called bound charges, right, because of those the electric field inside will be less, right. You have studied those things in your electrostatics, right. But what if I introduce a metallic block inside, what will be the electric field inside the metallic block, E inside? Can you answer this question? What would be the magnitude of electric field inside the metallic block? It would be 0. In fact, in fact, this is what you learn in electrostatics. So, if it is a static field, 
it would be 0 for sure. You put a, uh, you know, a metallic shell uh, in a uniform, uh, in any electric field actually, it need not be uniform, it can be spatially varying. The electric field inside the shell would be 0. Instead of a shell, if you take a metallic ball, the result will remain the same. Inside the metallic ball, the electric field will be 0. Why is the electric field becoming 0? Because there are free electrons. What do the electrons do? They rearrange themselves in response to the electric field. So, the, the, the uh, electrons will pile up on one of the faces and the other face will become positively charged. Right? So, in this case, if this plate is positive, then you will get a negative charge over here and you will get a positive charge over here. And these negative and positive charges will produce the same amount of electric field as you have applied externally, but in the opposite direction, so that the E inside remains 0. Right? This is a result, result from electrostatics. Now, I am asking if we connect it to an AC source and start varying omega, okay, then would this result remain true? That is the question that I am asking. So, what, what will happen? Suppose you are changing your omega or let us talk in terms of nu, which is easier to uh, think of. So, let us say if your nu is changing 50 times in a second, 50 hertz is the frequency. So, 50 oscillations in one second, do you think the, the electrons in the metal will be able to respond that fast? Or you, you think they are too sluggish because 50 is a large number, 50 oscillations in one second. So, 50 times you are changing the polarity, the electrons will get tired very soon and they will say, oh, let us give up, let the electric field go in. Would that happen? Or will it remain E inside 0? Fifty hertz is not a big number for electrons to get tired. So, what is a big number for electrons? It can be of the order of megahertz. Okay, so that's that's a that's a good answer. It's close to, uh, well, not really close, but it is uh, at least uh, one answer is very clear that that fifty hertz is too low. In fact, one megahertz is also too low. The electrons can very easily respond to a, f a frequency of 1 megahertz. So, the aim of this lecture is to understand what happens to a metallic conductor when it is placed in an AC field, AC electric field. Now, as I told you, generating electric fields of very high frequencies is also not that easy, right? So, what we are going to do is, we will change our experimental setup a little bit. And we are going to subject our solid by an electric field, in an electromagnetic field. So, instead of you know relying on an electrical source, a source meter to generate an electric field for us using a parallel plate capacitor, what we are going to do is we are going to put a laser here. We will shine laser. So, laser has both electric vector and magnetic vector. It is an electromagnetic wave, is not it? The electromagnetic wave, wave is traveling in this direction. So, there is an electric vector and that electric vector is let us say oscillating in this plane and the magnetic vector is oscillating in a plane perpendicular to it. And this electric vector, what, we, what it will do is in the positive half cycle, let us call this as positive half cycle, it will drift the electrons towards this direction because the force on electrons is opposite to the direction of electric field and in the negative half ci cycle, it will do the opposite. Okay? And now, we can vary omega hugely, right? We can vary omega hugely because even for visible light, omega is of the order of 10 to the power 14, 15 hertz, right? And then you can go to UV, ultraviolet, and then you can go to even higher frequencies, isn't it? By shortening the wavelengths. So, you can perform this experiment and then you can ask yourself, how is this metallic block going to behave to this incident radiation? To this incident light. Will it allow the incident light to go through or will it not? So, what is your experience? What is your experience? So, does the light, I mean let us talk about the visible light, the frequency is of the order of 14, 15 hertz, 10 to the power 14, 15 hertz. 
So do you think the visible light penetrates the solid, the metallic solids? Does it penetrate a copper block? Does it penetrate a silver mirror? You wouldn't be able to see yourself, your reflection on a thin film of silver if the visible light can go through it. Isn't it so? Right? So it doesn't go through it. It rather reflects back from the surface of the mirror. Isn't it? So the reflectivity is very high. The absorption is very little. Okay? Yes, what is your point? That we will see. So it reflects back, right? The tendency is to reflect. Otherwise, you will not see yourself in the mirror. The, what is mirror? Mirror is just a thin film of silver. To support this film of silver, you will use a glass. Otherwise, how will you uh, make a film of silver? So glass has no role to play there. The light is reflected by the film of silver, right? Similarly, you can put a film of copper. You will see yourself, except that copper is slightly reddish, right? So, why copper is reddish, why gold is yellow and why silver is white and why do they reflect? These are the questions that, that we want to answer based on a very simple mo model which was given in 1900 by Drude. Okay? Now, the other thing, when you are at the airport and let us say in, an, in, the, in, the, uh, in your uh, journey, you are carrying something which is not allowed for, by mistake, let us say. Let us say you have a nail cutter or a knife or let us say you have a scissors in your bag okay? and suppose that this, these scissors are in a metallic box. Okay? So what do you think, what is the probability that it will be seen by the scanner? Do you think you will be able to take it or the smugglers, they can smuggle drug, drugs by, by, by wrapping them into in, a, in metallic foils or metallic boxes or thick metallic boxes, do you think they can do that? Okay, okay. A, a close answer, but the correct answer is, and you would be surprised to know this answer. The correct answer is that beyond a certain frequency, there is a cutoff. Beyond a certain frequency, the light can just go through it. It can just pass through it as the light passes through a glass, a window pane. So, you have a metallic casket. Inside that metallic casket, you have scissors, or maybe you have some uh, other contraband thing. Uh, like a drug for instance, but do not think that it will not be seen because they are using a very high frequency light. That light, for that light, this metallic wall is like a glass for the visible light. It will just go through the, that block and detect what is inside, what is inside there, right? Now, you may say if what, what, whatever is inside is also metallic, then what will happen? Then what you are saying is right that there will be some partial absorption and that will get that will get detected. Okay. So this is what we want to understand in today's lecture. So we will start with a electromagnetic wave, and for that for an electromagnetic wave, we take the E component, the E vector, which is a function of both omega as well as time. Okay, and we can write it as having a amplitude that is omega dependent and then the time dependence is in the phase factor. So this is the electric field of that electromagnetic wave. All right. Now this electric field will exert force forces on the electrons. The electrons will move, try to readjust themselves in order to screen the metal in the beginning if the omega is not large enough and when omega is beyond that cutoff which I just talked about then the electrons would not be able to readjust themselves and the light will just go through, right? That is what we discussed. So, omega is the variable in that, right? And the electric field, all it does is it exerts force and make the electrons redistribute themselves, right? Now, the question is, the electromagnetic wave has not just the electric vector but also the magnetic vector. So, is it important to consider the magnetic vector or the magnetic force? That is the question which we would like to settle before proceeding further. So, what is your thought on that? Should we also write uh, uh, H vector, H or B? Uh, uh, in CGS units, we prefer writing H, so I am going to work with CGS units. So, should I write H vector also? Is it important to take H vector into consideration? 
fantastic. The magnitude of magnetic field H, H component in an EM wave is 1 by C of the E component, right. So, the force that will act on the electron will be even weaker. Why? Because the force is V cross B. And what is V here? V is the drift velocity, right? Because the electrons will make them drift. The electric, the, the force will make them drift. In the presence of force field, you have this drift velocity. The drift velocity is of the order of 10 to the power minus 2 centimeters per second divided by the speed of light, which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So, this force is going to be weaker by a factor n to the power minus 10, if not more, right? So, therefore, it makes no sense for us to consider the, the B vector or the H vector also in our consideration. So, we will just consider the electrical force, right? Now, because of the electrical force, what is going to happen is that the electrons will acquire momentum. The, the same momentum that we have discussed so far, uh, for which we derived this equation, dP dt, whose time average will be 0 in the absence of a force field, dP dt is equal to F minus P over tau. You remember this expression? We derived it on the first day. F is the force field, P is the momentum, time average momentum, right? Good. So, in response to E, there will be a P, which is also a function of omega and T, because it is due to E being there and it will be, we can write this as P omega exponential minus I omega T, all right. So, this is our choice. We made, we choose our electromagnetic wave in such a way that the magnitude is only omega dependent, the amplitude of the EM is only omega dependent and uh, P is a consequence of this, right. Now, of course, when an electromagnetic wave interacts with matter, you can also have some non-linear processes that can happen, right. So, uh, and, and higher harmonics can also be important in some cases, but in this case, we will just deal with omega. I will just say that this is, this is what we are seeking actually. We are, we are looking for uh, the situation where we will study the effect uh, to, the, to the extent that only this is important, only this part is important as a consequence of this force field. So, this is my force field, force field, if I multiply this E with E force field. Now, I can plug these two in my equation over here. So, if you take time derivative of p, it will be minus i omega p equals to the force field which is minus e times e minus p divided by tau. Is that fine? So, I can move these negative signs over here and bring this guy over this side. So, I will have i omega minus 1 over tau times the p vector is equal to e times the e vector, all right. And I can readjust adjust this and also I can, you know, uh, since I want to get an expression for the current density and I know that the current density j is nothing but n e, e with a negative sign because we are dealing with electrons minus e times the drift velocity v, right? And the drift velocity v can be written as, can be written as p by m, right? So, from here you can get the value of p, you can plug that in over here, right? So, then you will have an expression which is, which connects j to e, okay? And uh, you do it carefully. You put the, put this here, so you get I omega tau minus 1 and then P and instead of, for, for, for P I will write M then J vector divided by N E with a negative sign. So, I can take the negative sign over here and write it like this 
right? It's this negative sign. So I should make it maybe, I should write it more clearly, n times minus e, this negative sign. And this is equal to your e, e. And now you can readjust them. So if you do it, do that, I'm going to, so it, you will get n e square by m in the, in the numerator and the denominator you will get 1 minus i omega tau, right? So you get n e square by m, n e square tau. So there is a tau also. Remember you took the omega tau minus 1 divided by omega, right? So this tau and this n e will go here. So you will get n e square tau by m divided by divided by 1 minus i omega tau that's the expression that i have obtained now now but you know that j is sigma e so therefore i got an expression for sigma that my sigma is this so therefore, the expression for sigma omega, because it depends on omega, right? The numerator is a constant, but the denominator depends on omega and it's a complex quantity. So sigma omega is equal to, and do you recognize this quantity over here? What is it? N e square tau by m. What is this? This is the DC electrical conductivity, isn't it, sigma? That is what we got yesterday in our, yeah, we derive an ex this, this expression. When we apply a DC current, then the conductivity is this much, right? So we can, we are going to write this as sigma naught. Sigma naught is the value of DC electrical conductivity or the conductivity when omega is 0 over 1 minus I omega tau. This is the expression for sigma and you can see that if you put omega equal to 0, you get sigma equal to sigma naught, which is the DC electrical conductivity, which is what you should get. So it's fairly fair enough. So this quantity that we have obtained, that we have derived now, this quantity is called AC, AC conductivity, not AC electrical conductivity. because we are not doing, we, are, we have not made an electrical circuit. This is just the AC conductivity, AC optical conductivity rather. Right. Okay. Now, in order to get further insight, we should write, we should try to try to first justify using that equation, the first equation dp dt equals f minus p by tau, which we derived assuming the force field to be uniform, spatially uniform. We derived it, you remember, in the context of a uniform electric field, isn't it? You remember the first lecture, uniform electric. But here the electric field is not uniform, right? The electric field is time varying, right? So at any point, at any position, the magnitude of electric field will increase and decrease sinusoidally, right? So how should we justify using that equation when the electric field is time varying? So the thing is that in your material, the electrons, they have a mean free path in Drude's model, in Drude's metal, the mean free path is of the order of 1 angstrom to 10 angstrom. We showed it yesterday, right? Whereas the omegas that we are considering for instance, if you take omega to be, uh, let us say, 1 megahertz, the corresponding wavelength of the light would be huge. So, for instance, for uh, visible light, for red light, the wavelength is of the order of, what, 5000 angstroms, right? So, your mean free path is about 1 to 10 angstroms, whereas the wavelength of the light is of the order of few thousand angstroms, if not more. Okay, it will be more if the frequency is less. So it is a huge 
uh, wavelength. So over the wavelength of the light, you can think of you know a, some sort of a uniformity. You can justify using that equation because the wavelength of light that you are using is much much larger compared to the mean free path of the electron. So locally, uh, the the uh, you know the equation should be valid. And in fact, this is the local current that we wrote here, the local current density. So this seems to be fine. Now we go further. So we write the Maxwell's equations for this. So we write del dot E that is the divergence of the electric field in the material and this would be 0 right because you do not have any surplus charges. Is that right? You should think about it if you find it difficult to justify this. We, 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 we should discuss it further. Now divergence of H field is anyway 0, is that right? What about the divergence of E, uh, sorry the curl of E field? The curl of E field is time derivative of the, the B field, right? So in this case we are using CGS units, so I will say one, minus 1 over C del H del T and uh, there is one more equation, the fourth one which is the curl of H field or H component and this you know has two terms, right? one due to the changing electric field and the another one due to, due to the current, yeah. So we, we can write it as in CGS units, it will be 4 pi by C times the J vector plus 1 by C del E del T. We are trying to derive the wave equation in the medium. So we take the curl on both sides as we do in vacuum. So you take the curl on both sides, you get del cross del cross E equals minus 1 by C. Now H will have the same form except that it is perpendicular to the E vector, it will have the same form. So if you take the time derivative of H, you will get minus I omega H back, right? So therefore I can write this as minus I omega H will come back and since you are taking curl of this whole quantity, so it will be curl of H. Now you know what is curl of H, you can plug that in over here, okay, and you know this quantity will be nothing but minus del square E. So what you are going to get is something like this, del square E omega square over C square times 1 plus after simplification, a bit of simplification, not much. So this you should be able to do yourself, otherwise it will be a waste of time, class time. If you have difficulties, we can discuss it later on. This will be E vector, okay. So do you recognize this equation? This is a wave equation, right, okay where you have a complex dielectric constant, okay. So this is a wave equation. With a complex dielectric constant and this dielectric constant epsilon which depends on omega is now given by 1 plus 4 pi i sigma over omega. So I will write it here. So the expression that we obtained for the dielectric constant of metal is this 1 plus 4 pi i sigma over omega.
Now, you know, you can plug in the value of sigma over here, right? This is, is the same sigma, it is a function of omega. So, you can put this value over here and carry out the simplification, okay? So, you can do that and uh, once you do that, once you plug in sigma over here, you will get, you know, a real part and an, and an imaginary part and so on and so forth. But we do not want to really extend this discussion that long. So, what we are going to do is we will plug in sigma value over here and then we examine those cases where omega tau is much, much greater than 1. Now, you know that tau is of the order of 10 to the power uh, minus 14 seconds, right? You remember that? We derived it. Tau is the relaxation time. It is of the order of minus 14 seconds. So, that means, in another words, the, the, the situations that we are interested in are those where omega is larger than 10 to the power 14 sec hertz. Uh, in this case, it will be radians per second, but you know, I mean, it is a factor of 2 pi. So, I am going to change them interchangeably. Why, why are we interested in this re regime? We are interested in this regime because you know that for lower frequencies, anyways, we know the answer. The electric field is not going to penetrate, right? So, m we are more interested in the regime where the frequencies are high. So, if you do this, plug this in here and do us a little simplification and use this assumption, okay, which I did and uh, you, you can do it yourself. If I can do it, you can definitely do it because you are much sharper in maths than me compared to me. You will get epsilon omega equals 1 minus 4 pi n e square over m omega square. This is what you will get. You basically, you will, you know, by using this, you will kill this term, right? And then you will be left with only this, this thing over, over there, okay? I will rewrite it as 1 minus omega p square minus omega square. So, that is the simplified expression which is valid under this condition. That is the dielectric constant of a metal. And once you know the dielectric constant of a metal, of, of, of any object, once you know that, you can find out the refractive index and the refractive index n, which I am going to designate as n star for reasons that will become clearer in a minute, is nothing but the square root of epsilon omega. So, this is under root 1 minus omega p square over omega square, okay? <coughs> so, what do we see from here? What we see from here is that if the frequency of the line light that I shined on the metal, if that frequency is less than omega p, then this whole quantity will be negative and therefore, your refractive index will be an imaginary quantity. Is that right? So, in general, the refractive index of a metal has two parts. The real reflect, refractive index that you are used to seeing plus k in general. I mean, if I break it into real part and imaginary part and do a more, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, 
uh, I mean, I, if I don't take shortcuts and do a proper job of it, then I will have, I will show you the real and the imaginary part. But here, uh, I took a shortcut and I said that, okay, n star is this. And if omega happens to be, so we have, we have this result then. If omega is less than omega p, we don't know really at this moment what omega p is. But don't worry, I am going to make it very, very clear to you what omega p is. Just be with me for two minutes. But let's say omega p is some cut of frequency. Okay, let's not worry about what happens at omega, I mean, what exactly physically happens at omega p. Let's not worry about that. If omega happens to be less than omega p, then n star will be square root of a negative quantity, right? And since it is a square root, root of a negative quantity, what it means is that in your dielectric constant, the k term is dominant and n term is nearly zero, right? So your k is dominant. Well, that's one, that's one message, that's one thing that we extracted. But the other thing that we extracted is that in this situation, if omega is less than omega p, then epsilon is negative. And if epsilon is negative, where is the wave equation? Oh, sorry, I, I erased the wave equation. I shouldn't have. I must re rewrite it because that's very important. We cannot uh, leave that. So I am going to sacrifice something, uh, maybe this, we will just remember that omega p, because I am gathering here all the formulas, so the formula for omega p, whatever this and whatever this quantity is, is nothing but 4 pi n e square by m. Some frequency, what is it we will see later. And the wave equation that we had derived was this minus del square E equals omega square by C square epsilon omega e vector and this is our dielectric constant here. Now when this you can you can put this negative sign here then it will look much better right here it, it looks much familiar it looks like the simple harmonic oscillator d2y dx square plus whatever omega square x equal to 0 right. Now, if, if this quantity is a positive quantity, if this quantity is a positive, these two are anyways positive. If this quantity is a positive quantity, the solution of this equation are oscillatory, harmonic, right? On the other hand, if this quantity happens to be a negative quantity, then it is a differential equation of the form d2y dx square minus omega square y equal to 0, right? And then it will have exponentially decaying solution. So therefore, what you have arrived at is that if omega is less than omega p, then the solution of your wave equation inside the metallic block will be exponentially decaying. All right. Huh? So that means if your wave, if you, your, your wave uh, electromagnetic wave was like this, when it impinges on the metal, then inside the metal it will decay like this. Now, over what distances it will decay? That is a different matter, but it will definitely decay, right? And if omega is 0, then it would not penetrate anywhere. If omega is, if, if it is a DC field, you know, the surface charges will just neutralize the electric field inside. As you go on increasing omega, this penetration depth will also increase, right? And at omega p, omega p is the cutoff at omega p, when your omega is equal to omega p, this penetration will almost extend to the whole length and when omega is greater than omega p, then you have oscillatory solutions inside the slab, metallic slab. So that means 
the electromagnetic wave will just go through and if you assume the refractive index to be 1, then nothing will happen to, I mean the electromagnetic wave will go through it as if nothing is there, right. So, the second situation is, this. so this is the situation when omega is less than omega p, it will decay exponentially, the amplitude will decay exponentially, alright. And the second situation is when omega is greater than omega p and in that case the, the your electromagnetic wave will, will go as if you know there, there is nothing in its path. We, you can see it more clearly from here. So, here if n k is dominant which means that the imaginary part of the refractive index is dominant. If n, if omega is greater than omega p then your n star is positive square root of a positive quantity which will be real. So, in this case the real part will be dominant right. So, in this case your n can be taken as nearly 0 and therefore your n star is approximately i k. On the other hand in this case your uh, k part is 0 and what remains then is that your n star is nothing but n and let us say n is close to 1, then this is the situation which I have drawn in front of you. Very interestingly, if you plot a quantity called the reflectivity, which the expression for which you may have derived in your textbooks, quantum mechanics textbooks, you may have seen reflectivity for barriers and so on and so forth. If you, the, so the reflection coefficient or the reflectivity is defined as n minus 1 whole square plus k square divided by n plus 1 whole square plus k square, okay. Now, when omega is less than omega p, what happens to r? So, let us go from here to here. So, if omega is less than omega p, if omega is less than omega p, plug in these values, your n star is approximately k, n is 0, okay. So, these two will get, so this term is 0, so square of 1 is 1, square of 1 is 1, okay. And so, you get same numerator and denominator, so the reflectivity will come out to be 1. So, r, if omega is less than omega p, reflectivity or reflection coefficient is 1. That means the entire light is going to reflect back, okay. And if omega is greater than omega p, okay, then your k is 0 and your n is close to 1. So, therefore, r tends to 0, right. The reflectivity tends to 0, meaning the entire light is going to be transmitted, right. So, the metallic block will be like the glass to the visible light almost, okay. So, if you plot the reflectivity of a metal as a function of omega, then what do you expect to see? You expect to see something like this. It might not be very sharp, I mean according to this it should be just a step function. But in real life, it is not a step function, it is always like this and this frequency at which this transition happens. So, here it is transparent, your material is trans, your metal is transparent and in this regime, your metal is highly reflective. So, in real life situations, this r may not be equal to 1 exactly, okay. It might be little less than 1 in particular as you go higher up in higher values of omega and this step might not be very sharp, it might look like this. So, there will be some smearing of this step, all right. But this is roughly the, what the picture is and you can look at, I, we do not have a projector here and don't want to waste time in putting the projector back. But I uh, will send you uh, on the classroom note some pictures where you will see the, ac the actual experimental data for, met for metals. For example, for aluminum, it looks really like this, it is a step like function reflectivity. So, you see using Drude's model, okay, which is based on very crude assumptions, we could explain some very nice things. 
Isn't it so? I mean, not in a very quantitative way, but at least qualitatively, we are very close to explaining things that would have looked different. So, this is the end of uh, this part, uh, unless you have questions. Otherwise, I can jump to the next topic very quickly. 15 minutes, I want to finish something which is remaining here. Yeah, but you are assuming your epsilon now to be nearly 1 because you have taken n to be nearly 1. So, your n to be, you have assumed n to be nearly 1. It might be a little different. So, the speed of uh, your EM just as the visible light has a different speed inside the glass. So, such changes will happen. Those are minor changes. Uh, in second, like will not change. Amplitude will not change. Amplitude will not change because square of amplitude is the, the energy that it carries, the intensity, because there is no reflection in this case, right. Now, of course, I did not answer the question such as why gold is yellow and why copper is that, but it, it, I mean, it comes from here only, but you need to do a little bit more than that. So, we will return to that in the, in this module itself, but at a later part, right, to explain the colors, but we have explained at least the reflectivity of metals. And we have also explained what happens at the airport scanners because they are using very high frequencies. So, therefore, the metal can, so the, the wave can pass through the metal, does not see the metal, okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, the rest of the class time will actually go in explaining what is, I mean, that is a very important thing. The, it is not over. The lecture is not over, really. And I don't think I can, I will be able to do what I planned after this, but it is okay. But um, explaining omega p is as very, very, very important. That is the crux of the matter actually. So, what is omega p? Does this p give you a little hint? Exactly. This p is for plasma. So, this is the plasma frequency. Now, what is it? This is the collective motion of the entire sea of electrons in response to the applied electric field. You now, they move collectively back and forth. The collective oscillations of the entire electron gas is what is known as plasma. Of course, in the background of the ionic, the ionic course, the positive background, right. So, let us try to derive it. So, here is the metal block, okay, and we shine the electromagnetic wave, which is being shined in this direction. So, that electromagnetic wave is exerting force on the electrons, okay. Now, at omega p, what happens is that the entire sea of electrons is going moving is moving in tandem with the with with the electric field that you have applied the electric field of the em wave there is a resonance there is a resonance the which means that the natural frequency of this electron gas moving as a whole as a bulk object is same as this frequency okay so let's try to see that so here you have electrons in your electron gas and you have a uniform positive background. So, I have done some coarse graining. Uh, let us stop looking at the positive ion course. Let us assume that it is just a uniform positive background. I mean, you can look at them as uh, discrete positive uh, charges also sitting at the lattice point, but that would not change uh, anything. So, there is a positive background of the ions and you have the electrons that are moving. in this block. Now, when you apply electric field, the electrons move left and then right and then left and then right. They oscillate with the uh, applied electric field. So, at, so, at some instant, you can think of a situation where a very thin layer here and a very thin layer on this side of the metal. So, everywhere in the middle, 
the positive charges charge density and the negative charge density is the same but because the positive charges are static and the negative charges are moving back and forth therefore at some instant you may see that this part is more positive why because the electron gas is drifted to the right okay so this part might be a little more positive it has a delta positive charge because here the background is visible now because the electrons have stopped covering it and in and in this part which has the same width as the, this this is negative the net charge is negative and, and a small positive charge and a small negative charge now when there is a small positive charge or when there is a small negative charge what's going to happen is that there will be a electric field right and this electric field is going to pull is going to provide the necessary restoring force which is needed for the electron gas to oscillate so the electric field is pushing it in this direction and it cannot go on being pushed forever so as it get pushed an electric field is created is generated and that electric field tries to restore it right so just imagine under what condition the electron gas will move in this direction when the, the external electric field is in this direction now external electric field is in this direction the internal field which is created is acting in this direction in the opposite direction to the applied electric field so this field which is being generated as a consequence of the entire mass of electrons moving to the left will provide the necessary restoring force right so you know how much this field will be because it's now like a parallel plate capacitor once again so if this charge density is sigma and sigma will be nothing but n where n is the number of electrons per unit volume times this thickness and let's say this thickness is d right so nd will be the positive charge and minus nd will be the negative charge and therefore and of course you have to multiply it with the charge of electron the charge of electron so this is the charge density sigma on this side and this is sigma on the other side now you know the the sigma so what will be the electric field which works as a restoring force so that electric field would be uh, sigma by epsilon uh, when you write it in in si units in cgs unit you write 4 pi sigma so that will be simply 4 pi and you add up these two sigma and sigma is n d e right and therefore the the force on the so this is the electric field so therefore the restoring force would be charge times the electric field e times e so that will be 4 pi n e square d that's the restoring force right now you can cast this equation in the normal usual form which is that if okay i'll make a small change here in notation let's say this displacement is not d but x okay so then in that case this will be x over here and this will be x over here so this is 4 pi e x so the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement so you expect shm simple harmonic motion isn't it so and also the restoring force is acted in a direction which is opposite to the displacement so i should put a negative sign over here you agree with me the restoring force is acting in such a way i mean that's why it's called restoring force because it's trying to restore the original configuration so i have to put a negative sign so this is your restoring force it is proportional to x and this is the characteristic of harmonic motion in fact simple harmonic motion whose frequency is given by under root k by m isn't it so the frequency of this oscillate these oscillations that will result from this restoring force will be simply k by m and k is this quantity over here remind you this is omega square p 
So this quantity over here, this is your k, so k by m. So therefore, it is nothing but 4 pi and e square by m. So that's the derivation for omega p and we call it plasma frequency. So what is plasma? It is the collective oscillations of the electron gas in a metal. All right. So now you now the picture should be even more clearer to you. So as you go on increasing the frequency, at one point, you know the entire electron gas will start oscillating because the frequency of your external stimuli, which is the light here, is matching with the natural frequency of the electron gas. And beyond that, the electrons do not follow the the, the frequency anymore. So they will start lagging behind. So what what that means is that uh, up to here, up to omega p, strictly speaking, up to omega p, uh, when, you, when you have a positive phase here, positive uh, plate here, it will become negative. When you have a negative plate here, it will become positive and it will change itself as fast as the omega of your applied excitations and it will do so up to frequencies as high as 10 to the power 14 because you can estimate omega p from here. You know everything, you know n you know E, you know M. So if you make an estimate of uh, omega P for different metals, because you know N for different metals, you will see that omega P or rather nu P is of the order of 10 to the power, I think it is 14 to 15 hertz is what it should be. Yeah. So this nu P is, it's very important point. 10 to the power 15 hertz because we did not discuss the numbers. Numbers are very important. So this is nu p and corresponding lambda p that is the wavelength of the light omega uh, will be of the order of 1000 angstroms. So now you know where we are heading. So that means if the wavelength is more than 1000 angstroms or the frequency is sorry wavelength is less than 1000 angstroms or the frequency is more than 10 to the power 15 hertz then you will observe this phenomenon and when is wavelength less than 1000 hertz you know the wavelength of indigo or violet color is of is about 4000 angstroms right so the moment you go below that you go to ultraviolet the metal becomes transparent to the light that's when it becomes transparent to the light so if you take silver and you shine ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, it will just go through it. So this is the cutoff, cutoff wavelength. Any wavelength shorter than this will make it through. So it's already 1 o'clock, we will stop here. I wanted to do a little more but I do not think I should keep you here. That was about thermal conductivity but we will just skip it or maybe in the beginning of the next lecture. Very, short, very briefly I will introduce you to those concepts. Okay, so we stop here.